race is presented by Budweiser, proud sponsor of the 1988 U.S. Olympic team. This Bud's for you. By Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. And by Dodge Cars and Trucks. When it's got to be right, it's got to be a Dodge. Hello, everyone, on this beautiful day at Sears Point, California. Welcome to GTO GTU International Motorsports Competition. I'm Ken Squire. We have a field of 34 cars ready to participate. And the story is a battle between Chevrolet and Ford in the front row and Toyota, Dan Gurney's great team, which has won two of the last three races. And as Bill Adam can attest, in the very last race, in the very last lap, it looked like they were going to make it three straight. Well, it's something that we just can't uh, overlook. It's very, very important. Toyota, we must remember, are the defending champions. They knocked off Ford and Chevrolet last year, and it didn't look like much of a problem. They were given a bit of a weight penalty this year, but they've come back with a vengeance. Two out of three, and they would have won Portland with a couple more laps to go. For my nickel, one of the most underrated drivers in America today is sitting on the pole, and right now, Bob Varsha is standing by with Pete Halsmer. Well, Ken, you've got it exactly right. The great production car rivalry in American racing history, if I can separate these uh, combatants, is Ford versus Chevy. And our front row here at Sears Point presents a very interesting twist on that story. Carrying the Ford colors will be its Lincoln Mercury division and the four-cylinder turbocharged XR4 Ti of this man, pole sitter Pete Halsburg. Pete, you're coming in off a win. You've got the pole in this race, but this is supposed to be a track for the big V8 Chevy sitting outside. Have you got the right combination? Well, we're hoping so, but you never really know, Bob. Uh, it's a situation where, you know, qualifying is one thing and the race can be another, and the car's performed just super so far. But uh, we'll have to see how things work out in a race. The turbocharged cars uh, have a bit of a, a tough time at this track traditionally, but it's gone well so far, so we'll just have to see. Okay, giving him all he can handle, we anticipate, will be the man to my right, Wally Dallenbach. Something of a surprise in a carbureted V8 Chevy. Have you got the right combination for this course? Well, we hope so. Uh, we've been looking forward to this race all year long because there's no straightaways. And when there's no straightaways and the turbos don't have an advantage, uh, the Lincoln Mercury guys got their cars working really well. And as you can see, you know, Pete went a, a real good lap here in qualifying. So we still have our hands full. We don't have them covered by any means. But there's not a whole lot we got to choose from either. I mean, we've got the V8 uh, fuel injection and a carburetor. And our turbo motor is not reliable yet. We're still working on it. But uh, this is all we got to work with. Well, good luck to you. Two XR4 TIs, two Corvettes in the field, and one of those other XR4 TIs is an interesting story in itself. For that, let's go to Rick DeBruel. Well, Scott Pruitt is a man who has had a busy weekend. Yesterday, he was racing in Watkins Glen. As a result, Pete Halsmer qualified his car sixth on the grid. That means you have a hard charge ahead of you. Well, it's a long charge. I'm just wondering how Pete did it, you know. I'm, in, I'm leading the points, and he was second, or teammates and stuff. I know he did his best, but, you know, you got to wonder a little bit. Does that mean at the start you're going to be running up along the outside? <laughs> no. You know, the, the whole theory behind this was, was just so Pete could go out and, and get me some sort of time for the race today because, you know, we did race in Watkins Glen yesterday. And, um, you know, the whole, you know, what we're just going to do today is just go out and, and try and continue to get points and not take any chances and not do anything stupid, just continue to get the points because that's what you have to do to win a championship. Uh, Scott Pruitt saying he's not going to be taking chances and aiming for the championship. Bob Varsh is standing by with the GTU points leader. Tommy Kendall getting set for the most important race of the GTU season this year. He's tied with Amos Johnson in points, but your teammate Max Jones is coming in off a of victory at Portland. Who are you going to be watching, Tommy, Amos or Max? Well, obviously the championship is in the back of our minds, but it's a little early to start worrying about that. So I'm just going to try to, you know, deal with my closest competitor. If it's Dorsey Schrader, Max Jones, or Amos Johnson, I'm just going to have to, uh, whoever's closest behind me, hopefully, or maybe in front of me, that's what I'm going to be worrying about. Okay, good luck to you, Tommy. We'll be set to line them up and turn them loose in the Camel GTO and you at Sears Point after these important messages. Now let's take a closer look at this two-and-a-half-mile Sears Point layout as seen through the eyes of our in-car camera aboard Tommy Kendall's CNC Chevy Beretta GTU car. Across the start-finish line at full chat and into the sweeping left-hander of turn one, 175 feet of vertical elevation changes, and most of it coming right here, the right-hander at turn two. That's a blind brow, as you can see. The drivers can't see what's ahead of them, and they have to rely on the corner workers. Turn three, a diving left-hander with a short uphill run, then it's mostly downhill from here. 
Drivers must rely on their brakes as they head down to turn four. Extremely sharp and a right-hander, but you've got to get through this turn well because you've got a short run down to yet another right-hander, and beyond that, another blind brow just after turn five. That leads on to the most exciting turn of the course as the bottom drops out and it's a sweeping left-hander. Downhill, turn six, the carousel. The drivers say it's critical to keep your speed up exiting six because you're coming up fast on one of only two legitimate places to pass at Sears Point, the hairpins at seven and 11. Screaming down towards seven, hard on the brakes and then throw it around to the right, but watch for the bump as you exit right there. Tommy Kendall handles it nicely and gets up onto what's called the back straightaway, but you can see just how straight it is. It's actually a series of right and left handers downhill and gathering speed all the way through the quick left and right hand complex at eight line up for turn nine and touch the left hand curb if you're going really quickly coming up next the most terrifying part of the race course turn 10 absolutely flat absolutely flat out when you get it straight take a look in your mirrors and if someone's there you wait to break at the last moment because we're coming up to that second passing point we mentioned the right hand hairpin at turn 11 and if you're not careful you might just get out braked and passed as tommy kendall did by that gto car as we complete our lap with 150 yards of hard acceleration to the start-finish line at turn 12. Let's take a look at the starting lineup for this GTO, GTU IMSA championship race. Pete Halsmore from Anaheim, California is on the pole. Wally Dallenbach is alongside in the Chevrolet. Going to row number two, there's Greg Beckett in the second Chevy and Dennis Ossie in the, to in the Toyota. In row three will be Willie T. Ribbs starting fifth in the second Toyota and Scott Pruitt, whose car had been qualified by Pete Halsworth. Going in row four is Roger Mandeville and alongside is Tim, Tom Kendall out of the GTU class. For row five today, Dorsey Schroeder is there and Mike Downs. Row six is Max Jones and Amos Johnson of international sedan fame. Then Katayama starts on the inside of the seventh row and P.J. Jones is outside. For row eight today, it's Al Bacon and Bert Kendall. Then going to row nine, there you find Letzinger and Cal Choquette ready to do competition. Row 10 is George Robinson and Dick Murray for today's race. In row 11, it's Chuck McConnell and Rob Davis of the GTO class. Row 12, a couple of GTUs. Larry uh, Chamara is there and Doug Barnhold. Row 13 is Bill Aberlein, and then the Benson Gallant team starts on the outside in the 26th position. Row 14, Wold and Henry, and Gottlieb and Cooper's cars of GTO class. Row 15 is the Lopez machine in GTU and Dave Krause. Going to row 16, it'll be Dick Greer, and then the Price Weldon car. And finally, row 17 is John Longmire, and with him comes the uh, Bellotti Rudin car. There's been one other car ready to go. That was uh, Don Reynolds, 35th position. That has been scratched. Good end car shot here. We're watching Tom Campbell in the uh, CNC Beretta, the GTU car, the pole sitter. He's violently waving the car back and forth across the track to try and do two things. Number one, he's trying to heat the tires up a little bit, get them as close as possible to maximum temperature for their 100% their efficiency, but also to get dirt off the car. New turn 11. 12 and there's the green flag and we're underway and now it's Mercure popping out in front Halsworth taking the quick lead and it also looked like Pruitt got a gate crazy dead Pruitt is able to slot himself in ahead of one of the, the uh, Toyotas already so he's up to fifth right now right behind the number two Corvette and Dennis Ozzy has moved into third spot one of the bets falling back a spot here into fourth Halsmer having to do double duty as Scott Pruitt was away, so Halsmer qualified both of the Mercours. There you see the Pruitt car, number 11, a little further back. And uh, Halsmer said he thought he fit the car perfectly, but found out as he went out to take his run that he couldn't heel and toe properly and was amazed that uh, it worked out that way. He thought he could qualify both cars up in the front row. Well, it's quite surprising. Little tiny things can make a great deal of difference as far as being right 100% on it. Look at this, a great battle right off the start here. Halls were running quick, number six, Maracour, followed by the Corvette. That's deep the break. number five, the black and white Corvette. Very deep braking. Now, Pete will be on the gas as early as he can, but he's going to try and be smooth with the turbocharged power of the Maracour. It's very easy to get wheel spin, and you don't want to overheat the tires. Pete is an extremely knowledgeable driver, and he'll drive within the limits for the start because he knows this is a long race. 
that Corvette may try and do a challenge. They have not had any reliability to date, and what they might want to do is to lead the race and get just some publicity right now. Well, there you see the top five, and there's a thrust by the Chevrolet Corvette. Dahlenbach trying to get into the lead at turn 11. Has the bottom. He may have to pinch it here. No, he gets through and is able to hold the spot. No, he is not. The outside line stays with it with a higher RPM. Back in front goes Halsmer right across his bow. Halsmer kept his position on that very tight corner and did not allow Dolan back to swing the car wide. By doing that, Wally could not give it full throttle. Pete was able to make a good run out of the corner. The number six, Mercur, retains the lead right now. For turn three, right here. And look at this scramble continue. Notice the elevation. We don't see this much elevation on most American forces. You see a bit of it at Watkins Glen. This looks almost like Bathurst, Australia, where you climb the mountain and come back down. An extremely difficult track. Now, there is a surprise already. It's one of our strongest GTU cars, the O2 car of Max Jones. Max That's Jones' car, one of the Chevy Berettas, in trouble. And you can see what's happened. He's had to wait until almost the entire field has gone by. It is not a critical mistake yet. He has a lot of racing in front of him. He can make it back up, but cannot afford to do that again. Meanwhile, here's your leader, Pete Halsmer. Remember that these Mercours have won four times. And look yeah. at this tremendous move as Halsmer's in trouble. A little bit of a braking problem there. You saw Pete's right front tire badly locked up under braking going into the corner. He tried to modulate it. You saw the smoke stop at one point. But this has given the Corvettes a 1-2 position right now. I expect that Halsmer will trot. Now, Dahlenbach is really sliding the car wildly there. And he is going to overheat his rear tires if he keeps doing that. And we'll be back with more of the exciting GTO. G Camel Championship race at Sears Point following these messages. Welcome back to Sears Point International Raceway, where we build a Ford Chevy factory battle at the front of this Camel GTO GTU race. We've got exactly that. Give the first round of the Chevys their first and second. Let's go back now to Ken Squire and Bill Adams. Thank you, Bob, there at the nub of the hub. Here we are at Sears Point, California, watching the Chevrolets running first and second with Wally Dallenbach and Greg Pickett doing the chores. Pete Halsmer's in third. Willie T. Ribs in fourth. Scott Pruitt is currently fifth with Dennis Ossie sixth. Roger Mandeville seventh and Mike Downs is an eighth. Leading in the GTU category right now is Tom Kendall with no advantage whatsoever over Dorsey Schroeder in second spot. He's right on the rear bumper of this Kendall car which is leading in the GTU competition with that Chevrolet Beretta. And looking out the back, there you see he's got just a little bit of interval now to that yellow and black Chrysler product, which is giving a great accounting for itself today. Really amazing. The Chrysler product had a wonderful surprise victory this year at Elkhart Lake at the uh, Road America Circuit, and they love to come up with a second one here. There's a nice shot right there. Now, there's the Dodge right there, the 07. That's a brand new car. They have been working on it a long time, really trying hard, and the car has been... been Incredibly quick lately. Schroeder is very happy about this racetrack. He likes to run this track, feels comfortable on it. He was telling me this is a track where he feels he can really do well, and that is exactly what he's doing now as he lies second in GTU. That's the under two liter competition. Now, as we're looking at the back here, we're coming into the, the tight turn 11, the closest spot on the track. Now, look at this, right up under the tailpipe. He's as close as he can possibly get, and they're accelerating away from turn 11. Look at how they're so closely matched in acceleration. He's really not losing much at all. Very, very close. And remember that they're only running about three and a half to four seconds after uh, just a few laps down to the overall leaders in this race. It's a tight course with a lot of elevation here, a lot of ups and a lot of downs besides what can happen to you inside that race car. I think the Sears Point racetrack is probably the most challenging track in North America because of these elevation changes. When you come over the crest of a hill, it's like being on a country road and going quickly. The whole car gets light and you, you feel your stomach go up three feet higher than it should be. You see 42 top 10 finishes for Tom Kendall in the number one Beretta, the red and white car, staying just in front of that Dodge as they continue their scramble. Recall that they started the race having qualified 8th and ninth, respectively, the Beretta in front of the Dodge. And now that's you, where they stay. You saw the 07 car there of the, the uh, Dodge of Dorsey take a little different line into that corner. These are different chassis. They're built by different people. They have totally different layouts. One car may have a strength where another one has a weakness, and each driver will try and play those off. If the Beretta accelerates out of a slow corner better, then he will try and get into that corner as well as he possibly can. He wants to use the car's strength. Here's number one and two Corvettes going by us. There's the number one car. There's number two position. And here comes the Toyota. Now, Toyota has passed the Mercur, the Pete Halsmer.
car that was sitting in third place. I think that's number 99, which is Willie T. Ribs, if that's what it is. I can't quite make it out yet. That is Willie T. Ribs running in the third position. Scott Pruitt is back in fourth. Pete Halsmer is now in fifth. And Dennis Ossie in the second Toyota is sixth. That's Willie just going down through the S's there. These cars are now running a, a, a lot more pronounced notch back than they have been to try and get a little more air onto the rear spoiler of the Toyota. Uh, they work extremely well through high speed corners. They maybe sacrifice something on low speed. Look at the flame just belt out the right hand side there of the car, of Willie's car. That's the turbocharger on a, a very small, extremely tiny two liter motor. Only 122 cubic inches, but something around 600 horsepower. Out of turn 11 through turn 12, back to the start finish line. Willie T. Ribs in number 99, averaging 94 miles an hour in the last lap. And what a great driver he is. Boy, you could not ask for more excitement than what this man can provide. The record for this event was a one hour, 34 minute clocking that Greg Pickett turned in back in 1987. The GTU record belonged to Bob Earl at one hour, 39 minutes. Get back to the overall record about 96 miles an hour. Uh, now the car, the car that we are seeing right there in our picture is the Dorsey Schrader Dodge. Dodge has passed Chevrolet and is now leading GTU. Great battle. This is excellent film footage right here. We can watch what the car is doing. Look at it entering a corner and see how well balanced it is. You don't see the front end sliding. You don't see any tires locking up with smoke streaming off. Really a nicely balanced automobile at this point. The braking is very good, and the handling, both entering and exiting, seems to be very, very nice in this car. Beautiful little Beretta there. Great-looking car. Kendall in the Chevrolet Beretta, staying right with him. About four car lengths behind now. The yellow and black car is the Dodge in first. There's the Chevrolet in second. GTU classification, and Kendall trying to gather some ground back here. You can see that Kendall seemed to pull up a little bit there. But now let's watch Schrader. Now we're at the fastest part of the track with the part that they should actually call a straight, but it isn't really because of all these high-speed corners. This is the, the S's. And just look at this. We're down here well over 100 miles an hour at this point, going from side to side and trying to thread as straight a line as you possibly can through here. Just approaching the extremely high-speed turn 10 right there. Now we're going through 10 onto the straight that leads us up into the very, very tight turn 11. Dodge looks very good down through here. You can see that there's no darting or weaving under braking. Smooth turn into the corner. He's putting power down well right there. I'm very impressed with this car. When you're watching a battle between the two highest tech cars in the GTU class. It used to be a class of very simple sorts of racing machines, but that Dodge and the Chevy, brand new cars, as Bill mentioned, have all the latest high-tech transmissions, suspensions, and whatnot. And if you think Dorsey Schrader hasn't got the race car to beat Tommy Kendall, be advised that he won at Road America earlier this year up in Wisconsin, a very fast race course. That Dodge has got plenty of racing power. Tom Kendall looking up from behind in this International Motorsports Association GTO GTU race from the 12 turn Sears Point International Raceway. Five left turns, seven right handers comprise it with as much elevation as any track that these cars compete on here in North America. We're back with the leader, and there you see Wally Dallenbach, the former Trans Am champion, winner here in the SCCA Trans Am the last time he was in competition, continuing to show the way. back with you at Sears Point International Raceway, just north of San Francisco, and we're watching the Chevrolets of Wally Dallenbach and Greg Pickett running 1-2 at this juncture in the event. Greg Pickett is closing on Wally Dallenbach Jr. at this juncture. Running in third is Willie T. Ribs with his Toyota. There you see the two black and white Corvettes at turn seven. I'm really surprised that, that Greg is going to close up this much right now. Uh, it's not something that you want to have happen from a team standpoint in the event that the lead driver makes a mistake. You're in a situation, potentially, you could have both cars taken out because of one mistake, and that's not the type of thing that you want to see happen. Last lap speed, 94.3. 94 mile an hour average around this 12-turn course. Trying to weave their way around some back markers here, those two Corvettes. At turn 11, big horseshoe here, right directly in front of the pit area. A little slight kink that makes turn 12 and back to the start-finish line. Under the flag stand they go. 
Just such a beautiful track out here for racing. Very, very challenging, very demanding. Not just for drivers, too, but for the crew. To, oh, no. Now, there is absolute brain fade on the part of Greg Pekka. He nudged his own teammate. Now, there's what we're talking about. We could see a situation where he takes not only his, his own car out of the race, he takes his teammate out. Willie T. Ribb staying in third at the present time. First to third is just one and two ten seconds. And look at this battle continue. Uh, Finally, it's Greg Pickett's move on the inside. He'll take first place away from Wally Dahlenbach. Think Dahlenbach let him go there a bit? No, I, I don't. I, I don't agree with, with Pickett's move at all. Uh, that's ego showing through instead of intelligence. He really wants to lead this race right now. And I don't know why he's risking the cars. They have a nice lead at this point over the Willie T. Ribs number 99 Toyota. And I don't think there's any reason to try and stress the car. Uh, Wally's car has not shown any signs of weakness at this point. He's not sliding wildly on either end of the car. You can't, can't see any smoke coming from brakes that may show a brake imbalance problem. And he's running down the straights very quickly. I don't know why Greg would do that. And it's very evident there's no team plan here, that's for sure. There should be a team plan. The, uh, the, the team leader with the Protofab team should and will have had a meeting with the drivers prior to the race and will have given some sort of an idea on what he wanted as far as uh, lap times, as far as pit strategy, and on and on and on. I can't see them being very pleased with this sort of a performance. Well, on the other hand, let's see if indeed Pickett does pull away from Dahlenbach. The Dahlenbach might be off just a bit here today, car-wise. No, I would expect that Pickett will pull away. I think if he wants to risk passing, if he wants to make that big of a risk, then he's certainly going to make a challenge to try and pull away. They've added some weight onto those uh, turbocharged Toyota cars here this year. Well, I think anytime you're a, a champion, you always get penalized. And this is what happened with Toyota last year. They felt that they had such a strong, overpowering season that they had to somehow slow those cars down to give others a chance. As a result, they added power. Then what Toyota did was to reduce their motor size down to two liters. That's a, an extremely tiny, the smallest GTO engine of all. They're a turbocharged two-liter motor, but they can bring their weight back down so they're not overtaxing suspension. We asked Ribs about the weight added to his car after winning the championship just a year ago. Uh, IMSA gave us a penalty that was so far out of ballpark that it's not even real. You know, I mean, the Nissans are killing people and they're putting 50 pounds on them. We won the championship last year in the last race in Del Mar, and they put 215 pounds on us. It's absolutely, uh, uh, it would be like a marathon runner strapping 15 or 20 pounds on his back and going running the marathon. <laughs> I must say, I, I agree with Willie. I did not think it was a fair uh, penalty for Imsa to put on. And, and Dan Gurney wasn't overly thrilled either. No, he was not. I tell you what, I'd like to see that new uh, prototype car that Gurney's creating. They're kind of waiting on the wheels. What a great team leader. Here we are, back with 41-year-old Greg Pickett continuing to lead here in Sears Point, California, as the Chevrolet Corvettes are turning things around here today. This has been expected to be pretty much a Maricor program. This is accepted as pretty much a Ford track, Sears Point, and the Chevrolets have come loaded for bear, as the old saying goes. Well, the, the chassis itself is an extremely good chassis. This is the one that was penned by Bob Riley, who uh, now is no longer part of Protofab. Part of Winston Cup racing part now with Kenny Bernstein. Yes, team. he's gone NASCAR, and I'm sure they will appreciate having his talents around. He's such a master. Ah, great, great designer. And it, it has always been a very, very good chassis. The motors, however, have not stood up to them, and they have had dismal luck with Chevrolet engines this year. No reliability and not a great deal of horsepower either. Now you see Schrader in the 07. There's the Dodge leading in that classification, which has drawn away from everyone. Uh, he has blown up two engines in practice earlier this week. He's really a little thin on power plants and holding this one together and looking for now a victory. And he's drawn away from everyone. The second place car is uh, Max Jones in the 02, which is the uh, teammate Whoops. of, oh, we've got problems here on car number 19 doing a, a loop. And I believe that is Davis's a turn car. 10 there, too. The very, very quick Rock section. Davis's car. Yeah, that is. That is just on the exit of 10, the very fast 115, 120 mile an hour corner. So he has given himself a thrill there. Meanwhile, the leader overall in competition continues to be the Corvette. And that's the car of Greg Pickett. And there is the leader just behind 
Tom Kendall's car. And it's time right now for our mid-race recap. And on the Volkswagen board, we note that Greg Pickett is the overall leader, having led for eight of 25 laps, those other laps being led by Pete Halsmer. And the average speed is staying at 85 miles an hour, down a bit here. There's been one caution today, three leaders. That other leader was Wally Dallenbach for a lap. A couple of lead changes. And uh, the attrition, well, they've, they've lost a few, five. Those are the cars out of the race thus far. Benson is gone. Lightsinger's car is out. Davis. There you see the full list of cars that have officially retired from this GTO, GTU competition. That's where the action is. Sears Point, California, here in the beautiful country just outside of San Francisco. Back with more in a moment. Quick Facts are brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. There was once a time when a driver was stuck with whatever setup he started the race on, but those days have long gone. For example, in this car, Pete Halsmer's Mercour, there's a number of adjustments he can make. The first is the sway bar. Throughout the race, he can dial this in. Changing the adjustment is his fuel load changes. The second is this orange knob on the dash right here. This is his brake bias. Determines whether there's more braking in the rear or the front. He might change that a few times during the race. The third also deals with the brakes. It's a switch for water brakes. If you turn it on, it throws water on the brakes, helping to cool them down in the heat of battle. One adjustment this car does not have, a dial gauge for the boost. You can't control it from inside the car. IMSA decided that was just a little bit too much of an advantage. Thank you, Rick DeBruel, and here's your leader in Sears Point, California. In the, in the GTO, GTU, Camel, IMSA competition, it's Greg Pickett that continues out in front. He has uh, a little bit of a lead over Wally Dullenbach. That stands now at better than five seconds. Scott Pruitt is maintaining third. And there you see the leader in the GTU class just being lapped. That was Dorsey Schrader falling back uh, behind the overall leader in the event. The under two-liter classification, Dorsey Schrader's Dodge Daytona is leading the Chevrolet Beretta of Max Jones. Now let's wait for second place right here. There are the two leaders, first in GTO, now in GTU. I'm sorry, that's 0-0. That is the second car from that team. That's Cal Choquette. Now, there's second place overall, the second white and black Corvette, right there behind the 17. And there's the 11 car closing. And what a story here. It appears that Scott Pruitt is locking up the right front wheel on certain uh, turns around this course. Yeah, Scott is not doing it on every corner, and it's a very strange situation. It's, it's a very hard braking area where he's doing it, going down into turn four, and it's the right... Whoa! Oh, now there's number two. Greg That's Pickett has Greg spun. Pickett. He's trying to get it fired. He's right in the center of the track. The leader should be coming up now, now or second Dullenbach. place, rather. And here comes the... And as he gets back underway, this should give the lead to Wally Dullenbach. Indeed, it does. And where is Scott Pruitt? Pruitt should be right there as well. There and he is. he is right there. So we have tied up the front three cars in the GTO classification once again. Wally Dullenbach has taken over. It was a walk through the park for Greg Pickett for the past several laps. Now he has looped the machine. He has fallen to second and into the grasp of Scott Pruitt, the number 11, Mercour running in third. Well, and the area where Greg spun, I, I can't see any reason for a spin. It's not really an area that taxes you. He may have just lost concentration for a few seconds because it... Again, with, with an area being relatively easy to go through, you don't devote everything to it that you have to. He might just have backed off that little mental lapse and, of course, spun around. So Wally Dullenbach has it his way for the moment. Running in fourth is Pete Halsmer, the pole sitter. Fifth is Willie Ribs in the first of the Toyota Celicas from Dan Gurney's team. Something Sixth also here. Sassi. Pardon my interruption, Ken. As we can see, look at, on the track here, these black specks that you see are actually chunks of rubber little tiny pieces come off the tire and when those little tiny pieces combine lap after lap after lap they make the chunks of rubber if a car gets out onto this this is the gray stuff on the outside of the corner very very slippery and all it takes to get a foot or two offline and you lose 25 percent of your traction that could have been the cause of the picket spin as well just being wider than he normally was first to third less than three seconds here and here you see the third place car scott pruitt car number 11. He has been ricocheting that machine off the curbs, really pounding that car as he's been trying to get back into this race. 
we started to say that Scott seems to be having a braking problem, and, and uh, Rick just did the feature on the brakes on the Miracour. How there's so many adjustments. The one thing you cannot adjust, if you're having a problem with one specific corner on the car, you can't change that. You can put more pressure on the front or less pressure on the front, but you can't change side to side. Very smoothly down through the carousel here. This is an area where you try and carry as much acceleration as possible. The Corvettes are coming off that corner very, very well. I think we've got a replay here coming up of what happened to the, uh, the Greg Pickett, the number two Corvette. First to second, now standing at about one and a half seconds. No, a little less than that. Here it is. Here's what now, happened here we, to our leaders. Now, simp that's it. He has just made a mistake. A little bit of brain fade, and that's all it took. Got into the corner. Too hot. Lost concentration. Spun the car around. There was no one else near him. And here you see Dallenbach closing, going for the lead, as Pickett pulled to the inside into the dirt there for just a moment. That's the sort of thing that gives crew chiefs gray hair. The seventh place car in this GTO classification is now Roger Mandeville out of Spartanburg, South Carolina. And Mike Downs is in eighth. Let's take a look at Halsmer's car if we get the opportunity here. Running, there is Scott Pruitt in the third position. Halsmer running now just behind him in fourth, ribs in fifth. Yeah, I wonder, I, I would expect that both Pete and Willie in the Toyota are having some sort of a problem. Oh, and there's Halsmer, he's coming in the pit, so obviously he is having a problem. Now, there's no smoke coming out of the car. There's nothing dragging, so I guess that's got to be a positive sign right now, but he's going very slowly. Bob Barsha is on the scene. There is a problem on Pete Halsberg's car. It is the engine coolant temperature. Scott Pruitt is running at about 178 degrees. Halsberg's, on the other hand, has shot up to over 250 degrees. But they don't have the time to go under the hood and check on it, although the clips are coming off now. They are, in fact, going to go under Pete Halsberg's hood. The tires have been changed just as a precautionary measure. They're going to add fuel to the car to make sure he'll be able to go the distance. But the problem right now has been whether that engine is just getting overcooked. Now, you see they have a pressurized hose that goes on to, onto a little port at the side of the engine. They are adding fluid to the car. At the far side of the engine, a man is checking the levels to see when it starts bleeding out the uh, overflow valve on the far side. A hose is brought in to clean the radiators. They think there may be a blockage right there. As you can see from the clock on the screen, this is a very, very long pit stop. 55 seconds has gone by for Pete Halsmer, but the car seems to be running all right. Team manager Lee White steps back and takes a look at the amount of fluid that they're having to put into that four-cylinder turbo. All right, they've decided to get him back out. And now behind him, I understand Greg Pickett will be coming in. They're about to send Pete Halsmer out. Let's go down to Rick DeBruel and catch up on Pickett's stop. Oh, Greg Pickett was supposed to come in and make a stop. He had a problem. It looked like he tried to break the car, swerved a little bit, and he blew past his pit and back out onto the track. The problem, we don't know yet, but hopefully we'll find out. We'll be back with more from Sears Point International Raceway after these missions. While we're watching for Greg Pickett to pit this time about, Wally Dollenbach is leading. And, and he here is. comes a second effort to get that car woed on pit road for Greg Pickett. Now he's going around here much, much more slowly this time. Not that much more slowly. Yeah. Now he's eased out of it. Yeah, just, just way too quick the last lap. And even that, he overran them. Rick DeBrule. The car is here. They are putting the fuel in. Originally, they had hoped not to put any tires on, but apparently because of the battle they've had out on the track, they decided to change the tire. They have to spend the extra one foot. Talk to Gary Pratt about what happened the first time around, and he said it was simply a case of Greg Pickett missed it. He came in too hot, a little too powerful, and went through. He's revving the engine. He wants that right away. Drop it down, 23 seconds, spinning the tires. He's out on the track. Boy, he looked like he came through the bleach box. Well, there's someone that, that's driving by emotion instead of uh, really following team orders. You can hear he's revving the car to the point of the rev limiter actually cutting and sitting in the pits. That's freewheeling a motor up to 9,000 RPM. There is no faster way to destruct an engine than what Greg Pickett is doing right there. So Dallenbach stays first. Scott Pruitt is in second. Willie T. Ribs is in third. Dennis in fourth. And there's Greg Pickett, the man of uh, whom we've been speaking here just recently. Having his problems here. Funny, you know, some drivers can drive off ah. emotion. Ah, and there's something waving. That's, that's, the, that's the driver's net. He's going to get black flagged again. He'll be brought back in the pits. And again, that is because of Greg Pickett's being so impatient with the crew. He has not given them time to, to do everything properly. Revving that engine highly, saying, come on, let's go, let's go. 
And we've heard Bobby Rahal talk before about how racing, really, when you're doing it properly, is a sport with zero emotion. You're analytical. You work as a machine, and you do the same thing lap after lap after lap as perfectly as you can. What Greg Pickett is doing right now with emotion is not driving well. The only man I ever saw drive with emotion and drive well was A.J. Point 15 years ago in sprint cars. Take him to Terre Haute or someplace, park him out back, and let him get angry, and he could do well. But uh, he was he was always the exception in that rule. I, I think, a, yeah, Foyt could become even colder. He just gets icily cold. You'll watch when he goes by this time. I'll bet you he'll get a black flag from the starter stand. And he may just come in. He'll have to come in. I mean, I think he would sense that there is a problem here, and he's got to come in. Comes by this time. Him? See if the black flag will come out on him. It may, uh, no, no black, black flag, flag yet. I think Imsa will call him in. That is a safety violation, having that net uh, detached like that. That net has made a dramatic difference in this sport, too. It's a good safety addition. Uh, in the event of a rollover, uh, the one that comes to mind is a Richard Petty rollover years ago at, I think it was Rockingham. No, it was at Darlington. Ah, I'm sure you were there. <laughs> uh, not the... His arm came up. Now, look at... Now, Greg got into that corner too deep. You saw the car, the back of the car start to pull out. He's missing braking points. Here's now, the leader again. This is the second Corvette. Number five, Wally Dollenbach, who is leading in the GTO race. We've been talking a lot about Greg Pickett. Let's go back with Colorado's Wally Dollenbach. Car number five, Wally Dollenbach Jr., to be precise. You can see Wally drives with a different style. He, he is very, very smooth on a car, does not use the tires up the way Pickett will. Look at him. He's very fluid going around the corner here. No wild slides out to the wall right I believe our interval stays at about five seconds between first and second position with Scott Pruitt, and it continues to be, ah, ah Greg the, Pickett's number two has gone away. And he may be just hooking up the net. He brought it down. Let's see what happens here. That's, that's what he's doing right now. He's trying to get it back into a position. He's fumbling with switches on the dashboard. Those are the switches that control electrics and fuel pumps. Now he's fired up, trying to get back underway. First to second is six seconds now. Greg Pickett not having the best day of his career. No, and there it is. Oh, and it didn't There's stay. Pop, pop back up again. Apparently the crew got on to him on the radio and said, you've got to get that thing under control. No. He gave it a shot, wasn't able to do so, and presumably he'll either get a consultation flag or bring the car in of his own volition. I, I'm sure he will bring the, the car in the pits. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So that's... That's Gary Pratt, crew, and here he comes, is. down pit lane. Now, he should make another stop, and I imagine we'll see another 9,000 RPM burnout. On to pit road. Close the car. One man out there, ready to secure the netting. That is throwing away a race. Hold to go. Now, he might have been told by Ensign to make a little less dramatic start, because type of start that he did the last lap, it, it's spectacular, and, and it, it may be great fun to do from a driving standpoint, but it really does get dangerous. You're throwing a lot of debris out the back, and you could potentially lose control. Back to the front again. Watching number two come out. Here's the number five car just coming by the pits, and that's Dolan back in front. Scott Pruitt is in second. Willie T. Ribs is third. And Pruitt is in the pits. Scott Pruitt's Mayor Coeur is just pulling on a pit road. This will move Willie T. Ribbs' Toyota Celica up to second. Here's Bob Barsha. No problem whatsoever. Fuel going into the back as Scott keeps the engine up. He's got to keep that turbocharger spinning. It's just a splash and go. Pruitt is back on the racetrack. Excellent stop. Less than 10 laps to go in the event. Dolan back. The leader is in. Remember that Scott Pruitt's second place car is pitted. Here's Rick DeBrule. Unlike Pickett's car, they decided to put no tires. This is strictly a fuel stop, having a little problem with the fuel. They're back out. They had been waiting to see what the Miracour was going to do. 7.9 seconds, just a splash, and he is back out. So the two leaders have both been on pit road. More in a moment. Number 99, Toyota. Dan Gurney Racing. Willie T. Ribs has it gathered up. Can he stay there? Laps are running out. Here's Rick DeBrule. Standing by with Dan Gurney, who is the crew chief for Willie T. Rib. What is the fuel situation? Can you go the whole way? Well, we think so. We got a little tiny motor in there, and it doesn't use a whole lot of fuel. <laughs> uh, and we have about a 7.2 second lead right now, so uh, it's awful hard to come in. We're going to go for it. I see your guys standing up here with the fuel just in case. 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just in case. Just in case, we hope. Dan Gurney in the pitch, crossing his fingers. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, Toyota has a big prototype car that they're working on and assessing for 1989 in IMSA competition. They move into the prototype ranks, and if Gurney brings one in, it'll sure draw some interest. Great team. Really so impressive. And a great man. Here is Willie T. Getting with the program. At Sears Point, California, has a seven-second lead as the laps trickle out down to an 87-mile-an-hour average around this course today. They've slicked it up pretty good. Yeah. And the running now has a manufacturer's mix of Toyota first, Corvette second, Mercor third. It is uh, Toyota fourth and a Corvette in fifth. And Roger Mandeville runs six with his uh, Mazda RX-7. I think the Roger Mandeville Mazda maybe is something that Emsa should take a look at next. Uh, Here's a man who is a great car builder, a great motor builder, and yet for all of his expertise, the best they can do with his GTO Mazda is running fifth, sixth, seventh place. They need to equalize that and get the Mazda a break to run with the Toyotas and the, uh, the Chevrolets and the Ford. Willie T. Ribs, is he tired of being considered a pioneer as the best black driver in racing today? Everybody knows I'm the best black race driver in history but that's not the reason I'm racing I'm one of the best drivers in auto racing period black white oriental or Hispanic Ray Charles can see that so <laughs> you know it's you know th that type of statement really does not reflect how good and and what kind of record that I've I've had over the last uh, five years <laughs> we, we, we've got to bring Willie out of his shell somehow so he can really tell us what it's like. Well, he really is good. Oh. He had a crack at Formula One at one time back in the earlier days. And I, I think at that point it was his ego that lost him the ride uh, back in the days of Mr. Wolf and company. But uh, he's backed it up with some pretty good runs. Every oh. so often he just he gets a little energized. Immensely talented driver, very fiery performer, and a great sense of balance in a car. He can get about as sideways as Hans Stuck can and bring it right back in and save it. And one of the things that impressed me both is he went to Indy a couple of years ago and turned a ride down because he couldn't go fast enough. I thought that was quite remarkable for all of Willie's brash nature. He said, no, I'm just not ready for this. A very wise move on his part. Dan Gurney was saying yesterday how he feels that Willie has matured this year and how much further along he is than before. Mm -hmm. Here is Ribs continuing to lead at Sears Point, California, as we get down to checkered flag time today. I think we have car number 11 back in the pits again, as I understand, indeed. We do have car number 11 back in Scott Pruitt. Here's Bob Barsha. Scott Pruitt, a big surprise pit stop. Everything looks good on his pit monitor, so it doesn't seem there's any problem with the car. It's just going to be a four-tire change. Evidently, they've got a bad tire, and yes, as the car tire is pulled off the car, the sidewall is absolutely gone. Something was rubbing. He had lost the right front tire, and he needed a change. So he was running in third when he pitted. Now, for, for viewers wondering, why did they do a four-tire stop and only one tire was bad? Sometimes on these cars, you can't really tell which tire it is that bad. Uh, there have been situations where you swear it's a back tire that's going bad, and yet it turns out to be a front. Look at that. Ah. The entire inner sidewall is ripped away. That's not worn. That is ripped away. Now, what would puncture something like that? Something's amiss in there. I would expect that, yes, either something has gone amiss on the suspension or he has jammed and, something up in there. And, and there's Greg even more Pickett trouble. is not having much fun at all. He's right under uh, the start-finish line, and it looks like the engine is said adios. There's the uh, Chevrolet reliability again. Full course caution coming out. Well, they have to put this out now. By Greg Pickett stopping there, he is stopping at one of the most dangerous points on the track. When they're accelerating and he still has the motor. fourth gear, right up through fifth gear, and he stopped at the worst possible spot. Now, they have told him to move the car. He has to get the car out of there. And he's rolling down. He really? can pull up onto what is the drag strip portion of the Sears Poised International Raceway Complex Not. as we watch car number 99 in his last lap, Willie T. Ribs. Just, just not a good move by Pickett at all. I'm, I'm very, very surprised that he would even consider doing that. Here's Willie. He, he's going around on his final lap now. He's just driving as smoothly as he can. Look at he's getting on the on the brakes very very early, and he'll be squeezing power down, not taking any chance at all. His crew are keeping in touch with him. You see, just on the roof, there's a little tiny aerial. It's not to listen to the local rock station in San Francisco. He's talking to this man here. That's the fellow on the right of the screen who will be talking back and forth to Willie, telling him his lead. 
Dan Gurney has said these cars are the distilled essence of everything we've learned about IMSA GTO racing in the past five seasons. What a grand performance Willie T. Ribs is giving with what Dan Gurney has learned about how to put a car together. Toyota Celica leading here today in this GTO competition. What a grand race it has been. It and has what been. surprises. The Chevrolet out in front. We thought Mercure would kind of waltz and walk here for some time. No walk over at all. No waltz. And then this major exclamation point at the end of the event. Well, I thought prior to the start that the Toyota would be a real reckoning force here today. They're, they are driving Dan Gurney races, and it is paying off. So Willie T. Ribs appears on his way, flashing down across there the line. Is. Checkers are out and give the victory to Toyota. That is their third victory in the last four events, and it might have been four for four, but at Portland, Oregon, with, uh, they were shy a couple of laps. We will be back to meet the winner of this Camel GTO GTU Championship from Sears Point, California, Willie T. Ribs, after these messages. In auto racing, the big Q stands for quality. In Quaker State's 11,000 RPM Porsche-powered IndyCar. In Ricky Rudd's 625 horsepower high-torque V8. These great racing engines demand the great name in motor oil. Quaker State with QSX, proven to run clean for unbeatable protection from wear and tear. And the Quaker State that protects all these engines on the track is the same oil you buy right off the shelf. Quaker State, the big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. ESPN is now the proud home of Motor Week Illustrated, America's first and foremost weekly racing news show. Keep pace with the racing action on television's fastest half hour. If it goes fast, catch it on Motor Week Illustrated. Back at Sears Point, nobody celebrates victory like Mr. Excitement, Willie T. Ribs, who waited and waited while all ahead of him spun off the course, broke their engine, stopped for fuel or what have you, and came home the winner today at Sears Point. Willie, spectacular drive. You knew you had it all along, didn't you? Well, no, Bob. What I wanted to do was try to not run too hard and run out a lot of gas and not kill my tires at the same time. I've won a lot of races here at Sears Point. So I've learned how to conserve the tires, but conserving gas was another matter. You spun it off a little bit early. Did you think maybe all was lost at that point? No, because it was a long race, and this track has a, is notorious for burning people down. You run too fast, too early, you burn down. So, you know, I knew I spun, but I got back on quick. So it was just a matter of just coming back, don't get overexcited, and uh, make another mistake. Did downside the, the engines to meet that weight limit imposed by IMSA maybe help you with fuel today? Absolutely, because it's a smaller engine, so it doesn't use up as much gas. All the bigger engine guys were using a lot of fuel. But, you know, we had, we, we went in not good in qualifying, but, uh, you know, Dave Martin and Ron Perry and, and uh, Gary Meyer and Stump and the whole guys put together a great car for a great show. I want to thank everyone at Toyota for making this happen and the whole team and everybody that's watching. Congratulations to our GTO winner, Willie T. Ribs. Now let's go to Rick DeBrule. Well, the GTU winner is Dorsey Schroeder. You sort of snuck up on everybody this weekend. Yeah, we were working real hard. We knew we'd have a good car for here, and uh, we didn't have time to change the motor. When Cal crashed the other Dodge, it, uh, it put the mechanics a little behind. We put the big motor in for the race, and boy, it really run good. You were in strong position, it seemed like, from early on. Yeah, Tommy gave us a good race early on, and we're running uh, together. And, He's a clean driver. We're waving at the mirror at each other, and uh, it was a real good race. I don't know if they had trouble or whatever, but I'm, I'm glad I won. This Goodyear Winner Circle has been brought to you by Goodyear Eagle Tires. Goodyear, because there really is a difference. Well, here's a final look at the final standings. At Sears Point, California, in this Camel GTO, GTU Championship, Willie T. Ribs coming out on top. As you look at these standings, consider what Dan Gurney said earlier this year. He said, we did the job in 1987, and we plan to do it again in 1988. And at the end of 1988, indeed, they're certainly doing the job. For Bob Barsha, 
Rick DeBrule, and Bill Adam, I'm Ken Squire at Sears Point, California. The Sears Point Camel GTO GTU Championship Race has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. And by the 1988 German-engineered Volkswagens and your Volkswagen dealers.